Hi, I'm Dr. Shanna Theobald, and I was asked by a few people about making a video that would speak to the impact that COVID-19 would have in the village setting, which will be different than in a urban setting. And um, I was talking with a few health aides from Gamble, where I used to work, and Gamble's very dear to my heart. And we were thinking it might be good to do a um, video using Gamble as an example. So the village of Gamble has a population of 750 people, and if 40 to 80 percent of those people get infected, which is kind of the range guesstimate, ballpark guesstimate from CDC of how many people in a community would get infected. Realistically, in a small community, like a village community, it's probably going to be on the higher side, like 70 to 80 percent, or even all, potentially everyone could get infected. And that's because one person will spread it to two more people. So if one person comes into the village that has it, they could spread it to two people, and each of those two people can spread it to two more people, so four people, and each of those four people can spread it to two more people each, which becomes eight people, and then it doubles, going becoming 16 people. They all spread it to two people each, that's 32 people, times two is 64, times two is 128, 256, 512. It's very easy to spread this among the whole village very quickly. One reason why 80% is more likely than, say, a lower percentage, like 40 or 50%, is because in other um, countries like China and Italy, where we've already seen the virus move through the country, it was people within households, families, and close communities where um, eighty percent of people were infected just from being in close contact with others. So that's more likely to be the scenario in a in a smaller village setting. So eighty percent of seven hundred and fifty people that means say six hundred people will be infected with the virus. Um, of the six hundred people that get infected, eighty percent of those will be totally fine. So four hundred and eighty people will be either asymptomatic, meaning they don't have any symptoms or mildly symptomatic where they might just feel kind of normal cold, flu, fever. Um, they might be a little bit miserable, but they can stay home. They don't need to go to the hospital. And then 20% of the 600 people will need hospital care. So 20% of the 600 people is 120 people. Of those 120, three out of four of them, or 90 total, would um, be able to go to a lower acuity hospital like the Nome Regional Hospital. Um, but 30 of those will be sick enough that they would need critical care. About one in four, and some, in some cases it's as high as two in four of people who need to get hospitalized end up going into a critical care unit. And the critical care support is where you know patients get intubated, they're on the ventilator or the breathing machine, and they are on um, IV fluids, medications to help support their body until they can recover from the virus. The average doubling rate, which doubling rate is the time that it takes for the numbers to double, so that one person to two, two to four, four to eight, takes about three days to double each with each cycle. Um, so if from one person to almost that 600 number, it was about 10 doubling cycles to get there. So if each cycle takes three days and there's 10 of them, in 30 days, the 600 and 600 people in the village would get affected. So pretty quickly within the same amount of time. Most of the patients who are, do end up getting hospitalized, they have shortness of breath. Um, that's the main symptom is the respiratory compromise that it causes, um, but they also might be sick in other ways. And the majority of those that, are being, that aren't able to stay home will probably be sick enough that they require a medevac or a medical flight out rather than just taking a commercial flight. Um, so that means for those 120 people that need hospitalization, that could be potentially up to 120 medevacs in those 30 days, which if we divide that out, that's about four medevacs per day, 
which we all know there's not enough planes, there's not enough medevac crews to support one village needing four medevacs a day, let alone if this virus spreads to all of the villages around the same time. We're, we know we're gonna be a little, we're a little bit delayed in Alaska and if it gets out to the villages, it's gonna be a little bit more delayed after that. And um, if one village is needing four medevacs a day, imagine how many more medevacs will be needed throughout the entire state of Alaska. And while hospital beds are one of the limiting factors, critical care beds are even a more scarce resource and medevacs are probably going to be even more scarce than the critical care beds just due to the time it takes to transport a patient and the um, uh, amount of resources that goes into getting one patient into, into the hospital. So the other really important thing to know about COVID-19, when people become critically ill, they get sick fast. They go from working to breathe to not being able to breathe at all. And there's a lot of stories and um, patients from the lower 48, Washington, New York, where they're getting intubated really quickly in the emergency room and sometimes they don't even they don't even get intubated fast enough before they stop breathing and, and just can't breathe anymore. So this is not something to take lightly getting sick with COVID-19. All right, so who is affected the most? First and foremost, our elders. Second, anybody with an underlying health condition. So heart problems, high blood pressure, um, diabetes, anyone with lung problems, including asthma, COPD, former smokers, vapors. Actually, they're seeing a lot of effects with people who have vaped because it is a lung, it is a virus that affects your lungs. Um, and then also healthcare workers. So the, a huge burden of people that are getting sick are actually healthcare workers because they're being exposed to so many sick people at the same time and getting more of that virus into them. And then also they're tired, they're worn out and um, their immune systems might be down and, and the virus um, can end up getting them sick. And then middle-aged and young people might not get as sick from it, but they are a lot of times the people who spread it to other people because they don't even know they're sick. So what, as a community and, and individuals, what can you do? Um, the one big thing is take a page out of the Alaskan Village history books. Um, from the 1918 flu epidemic, there is a story that Shishmara um, actually closed access to their village completely. They set up a barricade on the snow machine trail that came to their village, and they had people from the village who manned that barricade with guns and made sure that nobody entered the village. Um, they had already heard that the flu was ravaging villages in Alaska and killing off a large portion of many villages. And so they decided to make sure that the flu did not come to their village and they saved their village. So that is a really important history lesson that if the, if the virus doesn't come to the village, at least until there's more resources and we know more about it or there's a treatment or a vaccine, you can save so many more lives. So take it seriously. Don't let those would-be virus carriers bring the first case into the village. You can't know for sure if someone has it. They, a lot of people don't feel any symptoms at all and anyone could have it. It's important not to travel. It's important to stay home and stay put. So make sure that, you know, when you are in the village, everyone just stays into their house. The less traffic there is passing from person to person, the less likely there is to be any spread of that virus from one person to the other. Another really important thing we've learned about this virus is that it can stay on surfaces for a long time, uh, one day on cardboard, three days on plastic. And so if somebody, you know, a cargo 
worker had it and shed some of that virus onto the cargo and the next person was handling it, they could actually get infected from handling that cargo. So what a lot of villages are doing are wearing gloves to handle cargo, cargo spraying some kind of alcohol-based disinfectant or wiping down the boxes to make sure that they don't pick up any of the potential virus particles from the cargo. And in this case, you can't be too careful. What we're learning over and over again when we see all these different cases pop up was that people didn't think they could get it from some, you know, a simple silly thing like that. And yet um, it looks like from what we can tell that they did. The most important thing is when we stay home and we stop the spread or at least slow the spread, that is what makes the difference between who, you know, how many people can get care. So this is number of COVID cases from zero all the way up. And then this is time from the time that someone um, first gets exposed and then from there on. So what is happening right now in Washington, New York, in the lower 48 is that once someone gets it, they pass it to two people, it doubles, 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 and the rate of getting infected just skyrockets. Eventually, you know, once the whole community has gotten it, that number of new cases is going to start flattening and peter out. And then after that, um, people will become immune to it. They'll get over the sickness and then you'll see that kind of that curve die off. But when we do that, so this dotted line here is our healthcare capacity. It's the, the available resources that we have to take care of people with COVID-19 in Alaska. That's our hospitals and the critical care units, which are more limited than hospital beds. And probably for the villages, the most limited resource of all is that is the medevac flight. So how many realistically could you get when you need them um, kind of determines how the peak of how many people can get sick at a time in order to have that service available to them. So what we're trying to do is make sure that the virus doesn't spread rapidly and hopefully it doesn't come in at all and you can just keep the case number at zero. But if it does, the reason for physical distancing and social distancing and preventing the transfer of the virus from one person to another is to make sure that when people do get sick, it's only one at a time and it's and that person can get out on a medevac when they need to. And then, you know, then when the next time the next person gets sick, there's services available or um, resources like a critical care bed or a hospital bed um, available for them. Another really important thing to think about is that when the it's not just one village that we're looking at, and it's not just if you get sick or not, it's the logistics and the available resources for the whole state of Alaska. And that's going to be the main limiting factor in all of this that determines who gets what care. So that's why healthcare providers are asking everybody in the community to stay home when you go outside, wear a mask, because now we've learned that when someone has the virus, they can cough or sneeze it into the environment and a few hours, it can hang out in the air for a few hours. A few hours later, someone else can walk by, breathe that in, and then they can get the virus that way. Wash your hands for 20 seconds, because if you touch something that has the virus on it, um, you want to wash that off. If you don't and you touch your face, your mouth, or you're even somewhere near your mouth and the virus can get in um, to your lungs and to your system. Um, that is another way that it spreads. So wear a mask, wash your hands, um, wear protective equipment if you're going to be in an area where you might be exposed. Stay home, don't travel. Kind of think about that since we don't know who might have it at this point, it's better to presume that somebody does have it and your goal is to not catch it and not spread it on to somebody else. It's really hard to stay home and stay cooped up, um, but we can get through this and, and this too shall pass. It takes the community working together to make sure that you all stop the spread together as, as one society. Because even if a few people are out and about or, you know, going to hang out together and they get it, they can, when they go home, they can bring that back home to the, to the other people in that setting. So the only way to really stop it is just make sure everybody is 
following the social distancing and staying home together at the same time. I hope you all stay safe. Take care. We can get through this. Thank you.